All right. Hello, Fortinos brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is January 22nd, 2023, and we are going to keep digging. We are going to keep being Bereans, digging deeper, drawing closer and closer to the Lord until that glorious day comes that we are watching with all eyes, which is about two weeks from this time I am speaking to you right now. From here to here is our extreme watch. Some believe it may even go from the 28th of February. I still lean, as you guys know, that when Jesus told us in the recent videos we've put together with the well and, and the meaning of 70 and the understanding of the almond tree and these things we've been watching for so long all coming together. Jesus said four months early, the harvest is ready. So either this is going to be the beginning of the 50 days of the Son of Man, or it may be up here and this is the eighth day. This is something we've talked about many times. Although... <clears throat> I believe the bride goes right at the beginning, and then there's to the seven-day wedding, the eighth day he returns, begins his 40 days as the Son of Man. So as we're watching over these next couple of weeks with every ounce of energy we have, brothers and sisters, we're going to keep digging. And today, I'm going to go into some things that... The, two, there, there's two things, actually. One has been in the back of my mind for a little while now. Uh, when I say a little while, I mean like probably a couple of years. It's It's been not in the forefront of the back of my mind. It's just been there in the back and just recently started coming to me more. And I started saying, you know what? With everything else, the church has taught us about the, the tribulation time. Knowing that the, the seven years is incomplete, knowing that's that's only half of it, knowing that they're confused and not understanding the end of days is 14 years in 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 combining everything from a viewpoint of matthew i've been questioning something lately like i said that had been in the back of my mind for a while and it was something in relation to acts chapter one and as i started digging into it well you're gonna see it could be any more clear when you see what you're going to see because remember we're looking with end time eyes we're looking through the eyes of revelation that he has revealed to us in this ministry and when you see this when you see the words when you see the connections where it talks about where the words are related and i show you this you're going to say oh my goodness it's right there in our face all right so we're going to go into that and we're going to we're going to lead into another part that's going to continue on from there. And that is this something that I still don't have full understanding of yet. It's not very easy. And it's this, it's this connection and this transition that appears to be taking place. And again, when you see it, Again, I'm not saying it's the full answer, but I believe you're going to start to see in that second portion this end as we know of this one dispensation when the fullness comes in and when it goes back to the time of Judah. This this transition where one this this type of law ends and this new thing is brought back which is the time of the Jews. And within it is this is this trying to understand how Jesus, who is truly of Joseph of the 12 tribes, who is clearly from Ephraim, yet we're told throughout the New Testament that he is clearly of the tribe of Judah. I mean, it's it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of wacky, if you will. It's kind of it throws you off because it clearly to tells us, it clearly shows, and we've shown in so many places, and we'll do it some more, showing these typologies that Jesus was through the tribe of Ephraim. I mean, we talked about it in a number of places in the past. 
And you're going to even see this typology of him on the cross from, from the serpent during the time of Moses. And you're going to understand what it represented when Christ died and rose on the cross. You're going to understand what it represented, not only <clears throat> in, of course, the representation of salvation, the, of course, but you're going to see its connection in the end of days during the seals portion to see that what he's already done, we know that he doesn't have to do it again for the world. He doesn't have to do it again for the house of Israel. But we know he still must do it again for Judah, right? And in particular, because of a, of, of a group within Judah. And you're going to see, you're going to begin to see it a little bit more clear as well, because we've been talking about how when when trumpets time comes and Messiah is cut off in the midst of trumpets, we know that there's this, um, <laughs> the again, that is going to happen. Well, in the was that he already completed, he was a type of, of, of a defeating of the bad side of Dan as the eagle, him being the eagle. And in the end of days, the portion when he's the eagle is when he's cut off again, when they fly on the wings of an eagle, right? You're going to see the same connection to this typology of eagle, which is Dan. Now, is Jesus from the tribe of Dan? No, he's from the tribe of Ephraim. But you got to remember, right, those four beasts, those four representations of Christ around the throne, which are the heads of the, the tribes that go around the temple, right, being Dan and Judah and so on and so forth. Well, we're going we're gonna to see this with this focus as we talk about the eagle again and realize as we know that there's the seals workers are represented by the overcoming side of Dan, right, as the eagles, and they're represented by Ephraim, the two groups that Christ was representing the first time. It's, it's really quite the thing to see it's you're going to have to pay attention you're going to have to take your time and seek it and study for yourself for anybody that's new to this ministry and this is the first video you're coming to you are going to your head would explode <laughs> all right your circuits are going to short unless you've really spent some time in scripture but if you're new to this ministry and the revelation hasn't been revealed to you if you haven't been able to see with the eyes of end time understanding this isn't going to make sense to you yet. You might catch parts and pieces, but as I like to start every video, you're going to want to come to this playlist. There's a playlist right here called the Revealed End Time Study Note Series. I'm telling you, you need to come and start here, okay? This here, let me just skip this commercial. These three videos right here are the key videos to understand. After these three, you can go delve into the rest of them. Once you understand those three, you're going to see the discourse is revealed in order with Luke, Mark, and Matthew down here at the 11th video. You'll begin to understand the seven churches and how they play out in the end of days, in understanding the, the Old Testament was played out, in the understanding of the New Testament played out until the moment of the escape. You're going to see that pre, mid, and post are all true. And the only way you're going to fully understand it is by beginning with these two intro videos. This first video right here, we call Who the Gospels Are Speaking To. It's a 30-minute Bible study. Just take 30 minutes out of your life. If you read Scripture, if you study Scripture, and you've ever wondered and had questions about how come the Gospels seem to have so many contradictions, this is the video for you. Your end time eyes are going to begin to open with this 30 minute study note uh, video. It's six pages. I read from these pages. You can go into the description box under the video and find links to the website where you can get all the info for free. You can find links to, to this printout if you want as well. You'll find the link to uh, our Ministry Revealed book that we wrote last uh, 2021 in March and chapter one delves into greater detail of this intro video 
it is going to blow your mind. You're going to begin to understand that these differences within the Gospels were prophetic in speaking to different groups of people in the end of days. You're going to realize that Luke is speaking to the bride of Christ. Mark is speaking to the sleeping church. And Matthew, and, and the sleeping church, represents the world. It's, it's the Gentiles grafted in with the house of Israel that have been scattered and spread out throughout the whole earth. That is represented by the world, the Gentiles grafted in, and it's all, quote unquote, the house of Israel. All right? And, of course, Matthew is written to the Jews, the house of Judah. We're going to touch on some more info that I hadn't seen and understood before in relation to the house of Judah and who's a part of it, who's also a part of it. The second video is another 30-minute Bible study that once you understand who the Gospels are speaking to, you're going to realize that the end of days is not one set of seven years. And just as the Jews weren't prepared when Christ came the first time, the church won't be prepared for when Christ comes this time at the pre-trip. The, the great multitude rapture does not happen until the seventh year of seals. Luke's group pre-trib is the one going, as I was talking about in the beginning, sometime around early-ish February. Okay? That is the key time. We've done videos. We've explained why. We've explained how. It connects to the 70 years. All recent videos, we touch on it all the time. All right? But you're going to see it is seven years for Mark's group, seven years for Matthew's group. And you're going to say, oh my goodness, how did all of this get missed? And the answer will be found in the third video. It's a big video, and it's called It's All Because of Matthew. You're going to realize that once you understand who the Gospels are speaking to and realize that the years is actually two sets of seven, the final two sevens in the final Jubilee count, you're going to say, oh my goodness. And you're going to realize that the reason it was never understood I don't believe, I used to years ago think that it was because the churches were maybe hiding things and there was deception and everything else. I don't believe that. It's, it's because the Lord had kept it for the time of the end. When the books would be open, when he would make his revelation understood. And these revelations have brought us all the way back through the entire scripture back to the beginning of the entire Bible from verse 1 in the beginning. It will blow your mind. You're going to come to see that the entire understanding of the end of days is a fractal of the big picture of the entire Bible over thousands of years. It's going to blow your mind. And this right here is going to help you understand how these things were not yet understood. Because all of our lives we've been taught from the foundation and from the viewpoint of the Gospel of Matthew. And when all of our viewpoint comes from a foundation of Matthew for hundreds of years since the Gospels have been getting preached, everything else we see, whether we see things that look pre, mid, or post, we can't properly understand them because we try to fit them all into a period from a perspective of Matthew. You see what happens? Because Matthew is the final seven years for Judah. And what does the church tell you? The last seven years are for Judah. They're for the Jews. Well, guess what? They're right. The problem is those are the seven years of trumpets. What's been missed is who Mark was speaking to, which is this going to be the seven years of seals for the sleeping church that was not ready and too busy caught up in the things of this world. But the purpose of the tribulation of seals is for the purpose of waking up those who he has already sacrificed for. It's for waking them up. He is going to use the Antichrist. He is using the false prophet to bring about the greatest revival in human history because when seals are over, the time of the Gentiles, the time of the world, the fullness is done. And it's the final seven years that goes back to 
God's people that goes back to the Jews as it was through the Old Testament. This is what's going on. This is how it plays out. Luke's goes first. In the seventh year of seals, the great multitude rapture goes next. And when the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, it's that final portion. Let me give you an example. For those that had wondered, um, I redid the big harvest picture. So the way it works is every harvest, whether it's barley, whether it's wheat, or whether it's grapes, the three main harvests, they each play out as a big picture. So this is the big picture, but barley also has a first fruits, a main, and a corners and gleaning. This was fulfilled by Christ, the first fruits, and the main harvest was them that slipped in Matthew 27. The second one here is the wheat. This is going to be the pre-trib escape of the bride of Christ, remnant seals workers chosen. These are the first fruits, and here's the scriptures for it. Then you've got the main, the great multitude rapture, which is all defined here. And then you've got your corners and gleaning. Then you've got the grape harvest. Grape harvest is the 144,000 sealed. They're sealed before the great multitude rapture, also in 2029. And then the main post-trib return of the Lord, feet down on the Mount of Olives, and then corners and gleaning. All of this plays out just like this. Meaning, here is the big picture. Here is Father God in heaven. Jesus fulfilled the barley harvest and the events that were pertaining to it. The Holy Spirit wheat harvest relates to the church as a whole, from which you have the first fruits of the wheat harvest, then you've got the main harvest, and then at the end you'll have corners and gleanings. This is all related to the wheat. The bride of Christ is the first fruits of the wheat harvest. The great multitude rapture is the main harvest of the wheat. You following? It all plays out like a big picture. It's first fruits, main harvest, corners and gleaning, and then each one within their harvest has the same model as the big picture. And here is an example using just an example. It could be anything, right? So this is a crop field. I'll say it's wheat field. But the same principle applies with vines, trees, etc. So from this wheat harvest, the first fruits, 10%, are brought to the Lord. You see, that's how it works. And then you have all of this gold is all of the main harvest. So out of the 90% that's left, this is that great multitude. But you can't take the corners and the stuff that fell along the way called the gleanings they're to be left till the end for the poor and so forth. So that means 10% is gone, it leaves 90. At the great multitude rapture, out of that 90, how much goes in the great multitude rapture that remains? I don't know, uh, a guesstimate would be 85%. Okay, maybe 86%, I have no idea. But it's around that period. It's around that number because then you have the corners and the gleaning. And total makes up the 100%. This is the wheat harvest, just as it was the barley that was fulfilled, and just as it will be the grapes. Okay, this is how it plays out. So, um, these are the things that you're going to begin to understand within this intro series, and I promise you it'll be worth every moment of your time to understand if you have ever wondered how it is that. Or, or why it is that the Gospels all have these differences that totally seem contradictory to each other. They're not perspective. They are revelation. They are prophecy. All right? So it's very, very exciting, guys. I was going to share with you guys, um, I think I'll save it for another video because we got a lot to cover and it gets pretty, uh, it gets pretty in depth. But uh, our brother Brian shared a really great analogy of of what it's like you know if you're watching if you're praying and you're diligent you're seeking watching for the lord you're understanding in in some fashion that the time has got to be close and you're looking at a certain period and it comes and goes over the years and the next thing and the next thing it's like climbing a mountain you think the next peak is there and you get there and you're like oh it's not there because you see another peak and you get to that one and you think oh that's got to be it and it's not that one and then finally you see that final peak and you know it's there 
That's kind of where we are right now. And that's been the journey. And what is it? Mountaineers, right? So this is very fitting for Ministry Revealed, who are called 14ers, right? There, there's a group of people on the earth throughout America that climb mountains that are 14,000 feet plus that are called 14ers. And it just so happens we call ourselves 14ers, not knowing that. And it relates to Abraham, Haran, uh, um, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, Nahor and Haran. And Haran represents Luke, and Haran means mountaineer. So all of these fitting things, he's got a great um, analogy because he was a mountain climber. And uh, for anybody that's wondering, you know, where, where does this come from? Well, you can come and join us at our website at ministryrevealed.com. Sign up in the form. It'll take you a few seconds. It's free. And join people from all over the world sharing in there. And you'll see stories like that and and prayer requests and and news and events going on around the world, Bible studies, all going on in there. You can come and join us there. Uh, lots and lots of like-minded brothers and sisters sharing from all over the world. So as we get started, I do want to remind people, I know it's uh, one of those times a year where it, it gets tight for everybody, and I know not everybody can, but I just want to remind everybody, I know that we know that time is close, right? We're, we're expecting these things to take place within two weeks. But we still have to remember, if we can, provision is, our provisions are still needed, right? So if you're able to support the ministry, it's not just supporting uh, here in, in the ministry directly, but we help support others as well, as well as take care of paying the bills here. And for those that do, we, are, we thank you. We're so grateful. And for those that can't, but keep us in our prayers and are praying over each other, that's number one as well, all right? That is the number one. So we're always praying in over each other, praying over the ministry, and I know all of you guys are praying as well. But for those that can support, we do have GoFundMe right here, and we do have PayPal right here. You can also find it in the um, description box under the video, or you can find it at ministryrevealed.com, all right? Uh, the book at ministryrevealed.com, by the way, you can listen to it in audio, uh, it's It's been put on audio for free from the website. Uh, it's in five languages on PDF on the website. You can download the PDF for free. Or if you like the paperback, you can go and get it then from Amazon as well. All right. And that, that intro series, you know, is chapter one and chapter two. That's what it's represented of in um, those first two 30-minute videos as well. So with that, let's get started and let's start with some encouragement with signs that we're seeing all right check this out we've been talking about this almond tree now for a while okay we understand these things and and have dug into these things in relation to the almond tree and and how it relates to the samaritan woman and how it relates to the time of the almond tree and it means watch right it means it means i in and it means things that represent 70 because this year at the new year of trees is the fulfillment of the four years complete that the Lord said in Leviticus chapter 19 and then 70 years for them. Okay, this is the 70th year of the Lord God's count to the new year of trees and Israel is in uh, at Nisan. Well, why is this? Why is this interesting and why am I bringing it up? We've been talking about it a lot, right? But when I had showed pictures and I we've been talking about it recently, one of the questions was, well, is it really going to be that the the almond blossom is going to be in full bloom by Tuba Shabbat, right? Which rep, which is the new year of trees, right? It starts with the blossoming. It means it's the early sign of spring that everything is beginning. This is the date that is connected to um, the Feast of Weeks. Right. This is the true feast of weeks or sorry, the, the 15th of Savan is the true feast of weeks. And this is four months early when Jesus met her at the well and we showed the well. It means 70 and it means watch and it means almond. OK, so the question was, is it going to happen here? Because when I had showed pictures like from 2018, 19, 20, 21, 22, the almond blossoms weren't until March Right? I don't know if there were any even in late February, but it was well into March, even late March. And so the, it was kind of concerning and saying, man, is it going to be delayed? You know, and I don't mean the Lord delaying his time. I mean, 
is it not going to be connected to Tuba Shavat because, because the almond tree won't be blossoming yet? And then we said, well, I was saying how I believe it's going to be this year on Tuba Shavat, which means the almond blossoms are going to have to be ready by that time. Well, we know that winter came very early for us this year. And it came very early, not only here in Canada, <clears throat> but in the U.S. and in all parts of the earth. The cold came very early. And so I believe that it would be on time. And guess what? They were blooming over all the past several years down in here, even into late March. Well, guess what? The reason I'm sharing this and telling you about it now is they've already started. Now, this is an old picture. It's not quite like that. But you see, it already started on the 11th, 12th of March. Uh, sorry, sorry, of January 2023. They already started blossoming. They started budding, I should say, right here. Now it's some of the wild ones and there's the cultivated ones and they're not into their full bloom time yet. But they've already started in early January. That, brothers and sisters, see, this was something that was shared in the forum. This is exciting, exciting news for us because it will be ready on time. You see, because winter came so much early, the rains are coming sooner. This is exciting news. So I wanted to share that with you guys because it is very, very exciting. So let me take this out of the way and let's show something else that's very exciting. And that is <clears throat> this comet that's coming through. All right, this comet that's coming through, they say the last time probably wasn't 50,000 years. They didn't see it till I think it was about March of 2022. And it's not that it's coming super close to the earth, you know, regardless of what you believe, how far things are and so forth. But there's a representation that a lot of people, including myself, that have wondered because of the timing of it. You see, it started late December. And in this period is when there was uh, this visibleness and the closest coming to the earth is on February 1st. And then by the 5th, which is what? See that? In America, it'll be the 5th, but in Israel, it'll be on the 6th. So connected to the time of Tuba Shavat, it then leaves and it's gone. It won't be seen anymore. So it's been a wonder and a question to say, man, there's got to be something to this. Maybe there's a great connection. Do I think it's, it's the men's hearts failing them for fear of looking after those things? No, I don't believe it's that because this thing's far away and it's not really coming very close. Could it be connected to going through the, the debris trail? Maybe. But there's more to it than that. And as you guys know, I'm not an expert in the Maseroth, right? I don't know the sun, sun, moon, and stars very well. There's certain things I do know. There are portions that we've taught on that we do understand very well. However, I don't understand the meaning of all the signs and the symbols within them, okay? Well, there's a guy who does. And this comet and this timing of this comet is very, very, very fitting. And I'm gonna let this guy explain it to you, okay? This guy right here, uh, what's what's his name? Dr. Somebody, I don't remember. Dr. Somebody is his name. And uh, you can go see this over here at his channel. And we're gonna listen here for about four and a half minutes. And I want you to pay attention to what he says. Because one of the things that I really like about this guy is He's not trying to give you, here's what I think it means. Here's possibly what it means. He knows and understands what it means. So I'm going to let him explain that for you. So let me give you an idea of what this comment is saying in an overview, and then we'll start breaking it down in a simplistic way. So... The first time that the comet appeared available to see with the, with the naked eye, it appeared on the 22nd of December, and it was in the constellation Corona. Now, Corona is the prize that believers receive for being faithful. Reminds me of the verse of Scripture that Jesus is coming and He's bringing His reward with it. And that is exactly what it's talking about. In the path of this comet, 
It's ephemeride. It moves from Corona Borealis into the next door constellation of Botes. And Botes means he that rules is coming quickly. It's got one of, the, one of the more bright stars in the heavens, in Arcturus in the knee, which gives the emphasis of he is coming. So the first two constellations in this is he is coming to bring his reward. Now, as it continues to so move through Botes. So these represent he the is coming to bring his reward. And this is where the comet's coming through. Now, if the, the volume isn't very good, it's because his recording wasn't very good. I don't even hear it in one of my earphones. It's only in the one. So if you can't hear it very well, you can go to Steve Fletcher's backup channel, uh, 222, and listen to it there. Or you can come and find it uh, in the forum as well. Next place it cuts through is the tail of the serpent, which shows that he's coming to bring his reward, but he's also coming to inflict punishment and to wound the serpent. Then as it moves on, okay. you can't make this he's, stuff up. You can't make this stuff up. He's coming with his reward, right? Which is the crown. Those who diligently seek him, as we talk about, what is he coming to do? He's going to defeat the serpent, right? Well, that's going to be part of our conversation today, too. Exactly what it's saying, okay? I'm telling you what it means. So people always say, well, if we just knew what it meant. Well, listen, <laughs> I'm telling you what it means. That he's coming and he's bringing his reward, and he's reminding you with a naked eye observation comet coming through our solar system that he is faithful to perform what he has said he will do. He will do. The unbelief didn't stop him from coming the first time, and it won't stop him from coming again. Okay. A little sermon out there. <laughs> the next constellation after it cuts the tail of the dragon, it passes through Ursa Minor, and this is where it gets really exciting. Because Ursa Minor is the little dipper, and you see here there's a big dipper and there's a little dipper. And this passes through the quadrant, the outside portion of the bowl of the little dipper, but this Ursa Minor is representative of the bride of Christ. See, the body of Christ, here it is, this is the big dipper. This is all those that have been called out through the ages, Jew and Gentile alike. Anyone that calls on the name of the Lord, the big dipper is telling you that you have heaven made eternal life, which is promised to you, John 3, 16. We don't have to go much farther than that, do we? But if we believe on Him who is the subject of the celestial word, then certainly we have our place in heaven. Already seated in the heavens, exactly as the so book of Ephesians. This is However, something that was new yeah. to me. I hadn't heard this before. That the Big Dipper represents the church as a whole, but the Little Dipper represents that first fruits. He didn't say first fruits, but it represents the first fruits. It was like I was showing you. It, it it's exactly without the corners and gleaning. It's exactly what I was talking about with the harvest. You take the Little Dipper. And it's 10% in relation to the size of the Big Dipper. And he's saying this represents the bride. So as he's coming through, he's picking up his bride, right? He's coming with his reward for his bride and he's heading out. And you still have the great multitude. That's the part that's going to go through seals. All right. In Ursa Minor, what you have is a selecting out from the whole to a selected portion. And that's called the select of God. These are the elect. There you go. You see that? These, these are, the are the elect, he calls, and these are the select. Exactly. And the selected are chosen out of the elected, and the selected are chosen based upon their service for the king. So what I'm saying to you is, the bride of Christ, you will be remunerated. Be not deceived. That's God right. Not That's right. Saying? You got it. You see? They're going to be rewarded for what they've sown. They're going to be rewarded for the Lord. What is the reward, guys? The reward comes for the diligently, first having faith that he is God, and then diligently seeking him, believing that he is what? Believing that he is, as Enoch was, a rewarder of them that diligently sought him. When does this have to take place? before the 40 days of Noah, before the 40 days of the Son of Man. Hello. We'll reap. And those of you, and I'm sure I'm talking to you, because you care enough at least to be looking at this stuff, right? That reward is promised for you. And then it continues to get even better, because as it passes through, Ursa Minor, indicating the bride of Christ that travels up to Ariga, who is the redeeming shepherd, and then it disappears out of sight when it comes in conjunction with the star capella, which means the sacrifice. And Ariga is the redeeming shepherd. If I could flip the thing the around, you can see it, but shepherd. that's the way it is. So this entire comet is only going to be visible with the naked eye from, at most, the 22nd of December, but more probably the 12th, 13th of January. It will begin getting brighter and brighter until it disappears on the 5th of February. Hence, you can see that it was go. necessary to until get these charts. the 5th of February. Let me lower my volume. 
so I don't bust any eardrums. <laughs> All right. So I wanted to share that because this is exciting. This is again something falling right in the wheelhouse, right in the timing. You want to see something else that's cool? Remember how we're talking about how it, it just so happens that this year the almond is starting to bud way earlier than it usually is? Well, my wife being Chinese, as you guys know, we went and had um, uh, uh, their New Year's um, dinner uh, at my in-law's place yesterday with the family. And they, the conversation was how early it was this year. It was very early this year. How fitting that it's very early. Now you say, oh, well, that's Chinese. No, no, I get it. But do you know what it is? Do you know that Tuba Shavat represents the time of the beginning of spring? Well, do you know what it represents for Chinese with the Chinese New Year is a reflection of the time of spring about to start. It's the same thing. But I thought this was really cool. Um, and a brother shared it with me, too. I didn't realize that it went to the 5th of February. OK, or sorry, I knew it was two weeks and that it went to the 5th of February. But what I didn't know was that it was on the 5th of February that they light those lanterns and release them into the sky. Isn't that wild? I'm not saying that because they know everything. I thought that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying these connections to the timing. What happens at the bride of Christ, at the escape of the bride of Christ? A lot of people talk, believe and talk about it being like, poof, light flashing, right? We turn to balls of light, right? Maybe like some of the movies and boom, the bride is gone. And here they are releasing these lights into the sky on the day that we're expecting the lights to be taken. It's awesome. So I wanted to share that with you too. So if you guys want to check the rest of this video, uh, you can come and check it out here. This is the, the key piece of time. Uh, if you, if you didn't quite clearly hear all of that. All right. Um, again, yeah, we know it from Hebrews. Uh, we've shown this before with, with numbers, right? The eighth day. So this is another one of those things in relation to the eighth day that if it is starting over here and then relates to the eighth day at the time of the escape, right? And the Lord coming to begin his 40 days and all that stuff. Well, we've talked about these things with Numbers chapter um, seven before and how on the eighth day, you guys remember this? Let me show you this just in this connection. Number, oops, Numbers chapter seven. We talked about this uh, a number of times over the years and how we have this eighth day. So on the eighth day offered Gamil, and it's the meanings within the names. Look at this reward of God. So you have a reward of God that's coming. It's related to the eighth day and it's related to this name, which is what? A rock that is God has ransomed. On the eighth day, the reward of God, a rock that has ransomed. That's awesome, right? We, 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 we've thought this was an awesome piece of scripture in relation to what the names are telling us on the eighth day as well. It's just, it, it's, it seems very fitting. And the fact that it goes out on the eighth day, what would be really cool, actually, I don't know how to, how to find this, but it would be really cool to see when the comet gets to Ursa Minor, gets to the Little Dipper. I think that would be pretty cool. <clears throat> if it gets to the Little Dipper, say around the 8th or wherever it might be in here, maybe that's when he collects the bride, right? Maybe that's when he collects. Or maybe the final collection is at the last day as he heads out, right? Having redeemed that redeeming shepherd that was represent represented as that final constellation before it's gone. I think it's really fitting. I think it's pretty cool. Let me uh, close this out and give us a little bit more space because I don't know if you guys can tell all these little portions up here, but I literally had all 70 tabs opened. <laughs> so I gotta, I gotta let some go as we get moving here. All right, now let me have a sip of coffee and turn my heat down a little bit. All right. Now let's get into some heavier or deeper digging here. And 
this is what I was telling you guys at the beginning, that there was something in relation to Acts 1 that, that had had me wondering for a while, but I wasn't feeling too pushed, if you will. Well, I'm always asking the Lord after the next, after the last video, you know, and, and I'm always doing it every night anyways, but Lord, you lead me, always lead me. Let me know, let your spirit lead me in your will in all that is the word, our Lord and Savior, right? Just lead me. What do you want me to understand next? What can I share that you can bring them to receive and to understand and to grow and to draw closer to you, all right? And so it's just been a continual process. I've told you guys this a number of times over the years, but I don't have pre-planned videos. I have things maybe that, you know, I list and hold tabs for a long time and maybe I eventually touch on them. Sometimes I don't and then I just disregard them and maybe I come back to them a couple of years later, but I don't pre-plan. <laughs> for five, almost five and a half years, I haven't pre-planned. I've always just studied and let the Lord lead me. That's all I've done. And look at everything that's come from it. You want to talk about being spirit-led? It doesn't get any more clear than seeing and understanding these revelations that have come about, right? It's awesome. So here's one of those things that had been in the back of my mind for a long time. <clears throat> Excuse me, and again, what is the relation to what I'm talking about? The relation is to, I'll just pause this right there, is to what we were talking about here in relation that it's all because of Matthew. Now, what do I mean by that? For Especially for those that are newer, it means that because we've been taught prophecy, oh, oops. This right here is one of my 18 audiobooks that I own. It so, 82 sales last. There we go. So, All right, hello. even though, um, uh, uh, sorry. So, we know that everything has been taught from a foundation of Matthew. So, when we know that the church has been teaching from seven years, when we know that whether it's prophecy or whether it's the understanding of scripture more clearly and it being revealed as we've been showing, because of understanding the differences in the Gospels, it had been in the back of my mind to say, well, wait a second. If the church has been teaching that, that the, the angels are telling these, these uh, the, the, the seals workers, if you will, right? The ones from Luke 24 that relate to the, the, the disciples, those Gentiles, Gentile disciples that that remnant bride that's working and following the Lord during seals and is going to be here during seals, which, as I was saying earlier, are a portion of Dan and a portion of Ephraim. That when we're taught from this, we've been taught that it represents when he returns and it would be like feet down on the Mount of Olives. And for the longest time, I just connected it to being the same thing. But in the back of my mind for a while, I've questioned to say, well, wait a second. Is this really saying that they'll see him when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives? And so because something was just recently shared, I don't know if it was something in an email or in the forum, and I saw a video and I just thought, you know what, I'm going to go dig into this portion a little bit more. And the one of the reasons was is because we know prophetically the typologies in Acts prophetically the typologies within the gospels and we know that luke's group right the end of luke in luke chapter 24 those two that were walking that he came to they represent the ephraim and the dan they are the workers during the time of seals they follow him for 40 days and then they receive the anointing on the 50th day and they go out from jerusalem and they go to the ends of the earth right which by the way they couldn't have gone to the utmost ends of the earth back then. So it was it was an is, right? But it also is a prophetic in relation to the is to come. And when you when you remember that and you understand that this is the Lord in the typology at the end of his 40 days as the son of man here on earth. OK, there's a 50 day period of time, which is Luke's portion, which is the discourse, which is the pre-trib escape in the 40 days of the Son of Man. This period is also an end time typology. 
And in it, the conversation is to those who were following him for 40 days as the Son of Man. Right? As we know. So if we know that they're the seals workers, and we know that their time is done at the end of seals, <clears throat> because the 144,000 are the workers for trumpets, then why would the angels be telling them that they're going to see him as he was taken? They're going to see him come in like manner. You see, it can't be the pre-trib portion. It can't be the relation to pre-trib because this is the conversation. You get it? This is the conversation at the end of the 40 days. So let's have a look and, and I'll show you what I mean. And you'll see these relations to where all these things lead us. So it says, um, uh, da, 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 da. yeah, let's start in Acts chapter one, verse eight. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come unto you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Well, we know back then they didn't go to the other uttermost part of the earth, right? But over the centuries, it did reach the uttermost part of the earth. But in the prophetic end, we know that the, the workers, that, that remnant bride remaining is going to follow them. Then they'll join the apostles and those who are there in a place in Jerusalem. They'll wait for three days after the 40 days of the, anoint, uh, of the Son of Man. They will join them there and then they will spread out from there. And boom, we know Jerusalem will be destroyed at that point. And the 14 years of tribulation begin. So this uttermost part of the earth is still applicable, and it's the exact same conversation that we read at the end of Luke chapter 24. And then it says in verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now, what do we know about this cloud receiving them out of their sight? Okay? First of all, we have this one right here from Luke chapter 21. All right, men's hearts failing them for fear. And it says, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Okay, we know that this is connected to the pre-trib escape. And that's the relation to this cloud. So he left in that cloud. And he returned at that time for the pre-trib, maybe to even to the eighth day, and he begins his 40 days. But now this is the typology again of him leaving at the end of those 40 days, okay? We're gonna see things like, see, taken up to carry away. Let's go look at some of these definitions. Check this out. You see it only in Luke, okay? This, it's not found in Mark. It's not found in Matthew. So out of the Synoptic Gospels, of course, we find it only in Luke. Let's keep going. So from here, uh, verse 10. Now listen to this. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. The white, of course, right? Represented of the Luke group and apparel. Check this out. Okay, so he's dressed in white apparel. This word for apparel is 2066. And where do you think that's going to be found? What do we know about the differences in the Gospels? This is one of those beautiful ones. We've got a video called The Differences uh, uh, Revealed in the Robe. Okay, and what it is, is if anybody has gone into the story of the resurrection of Christ, you're, I mean, in the, in the crucifixion story, you're going to see that in Luke, he was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful, and so forth. If you go into Mark, he was arrayed in purple. If you go to Matthew, he was arrayed in scarlet. If you go into John, it's a different kind of purple from Mark's, and there's a whole reason to each of them. And it is absolutely fantastic to understand. Well, these represented in the white apparel is just like the Lord when he came in the cloud, it's related to the Luke group. And we can prove it. <coughs> Excuse me. Because just like the discourses, only Luke's 
said that he, they'll see him coming in a cloud singular. In Mark, it says they're going to see him coming in the clouds plural. In Matthew, it says he's going to be coming on the clouds because it's at the end, you see? So we know this is all related to Luke's and it's the beginning time in the typology. And what about this white apparel, 2066? Well, let's have a look. This white apparel for 2066, look at that. It's only in Luke's gospel. And it's directly related to what we've been talking about, the gorgeous white robe. This is all related to the bride of Christ. You see, one thing we always have to keep to keep in mind is this is him leaving in the cloud and we know he's coming in that cloud right for the escape we know those that escape are in the white apparel right they're like the bride of christ but at this point here it's like the end of his 40 days right so what we also always need to remember is first peter chapter one. First peter chapter one is this group chosen out who have an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. They're reserved in heaven for them. They were those who are kept by the power of God, <coughs> excuse me, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time, at the end of days. This is that same worker group. This is that remnant bride that we're talking about. This is that group that is now looking up after he's left after the 40 days, okay? They also have white. They also are a portion of the bride and they have their place reserved for them in heaven. <clears throat> but what's happening is now these two men or probably the angels that were standing by them are telling them, hey, what are you looking up for? Okay, listen to what it says in verse 11, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner. It's pretty awesome. Well, the what had gotten me down this trail was it wasn't any of this from verse 9 or 10 because the connections to verse nine and 10 are all related to the pre-trib group and, and a recognition of them being a part of this pre-trib group as the first Peter one, that group that, that has the place reserved for them in heaven. They're the seals workers, okay? We've shown them to be the Ephraim portion and the Dan portion, the good side of Dan, which will tie into what we're gonna talk a little bit later. But what was really, the thing that was on my mind over the years was verse 11, because we know who this group is. They've now been with them for 40 days, and now they're going to be going out through the time of seals, as we know as the Smyrna group. All right, the Smyrna group, one portion of them is clearly Priscilla and Aquila, and Aquila is the eagle, which is the Dan portion. It's beautiful to understand when you see where this is going to lead because it ties into when they were in the wilderness and they start complaining with Moses and they're getting bit by serpents. And they put a serpent on, uh, they make that bronze serpent and put it on the cross and Christ was the reflection of that. Do you know what it relates to? <clears throat> Dan and the eagle, the, the serpent side of Dan and the eagle side of Dan that he fulfilled. It's beautiful. So isn't it fitting that those who are going to be working during seals, that a portion of them that have their place reserved in heaven are the Dan and Ephraim, but in particular in this conversation, the Dan portion, the overcoming eagle Aquilas, they're going to fulfill his work this portion of time during seals for which he already died on the cross for them. You see, Christ doesn't have to do the again portion for this group. He's already done it. Now he just has to save them. Save them. He just has to wake them up. How is he going to wake them up? You got it. He's going to use the false prophet and the antichrist. That's the purpose, guys. That's the purpose. 
It's going to be a wicked and terrible time. World War III and then the Antichrist and false prophet and fleeing and everything else. <clears throat> it's going to be terrible. It's going to be worse than ever before in history. And mid-trumpets is going to be worse than this. But it's all for his glory. I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to prove it to you in who we revealed is a representation of the false prophet and the Antichrist. You you guys already know in the celestials what they represent. And I'm going to prove it was them that helped bring this group in. Seems contradictory, doesn't it? Doesn't it? But it's not. These were the ones being used to wake up that end time group. Why does the the church Oh sure they they proclaim Jesus but yet they're caught up in the things of this world. Why is seals taking place? Why does it have to happen? Why is he going to use the Antichrist and the false prophet to fulfill it? Because it's the end of their age. Their time is up. They're not going to have the rest of their lives to wake up. So he's got to do everything he can to bring them about so that they wake up and come in and that is why it's going to be the greatest revival in human history it's awesome don't worry we're going to get into some words here and it's going to blow your mind we're going to get back to the the taken up part right here in verse 11 but watch this um this same jesus which was taken up from you into heaven shall also come in like manner okay shall come in like manner like turn check this out turn as in revolution okay but you you find out that there's no turn or revolution within the lord there's no turning of his ways watch this here's the word right here and you're going to see this rabbit trail i went down it's only used one time in the greek every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the father of lights with whom is no variableness neither shadow of turning okay that's going to come down from the father of lights well check this out we've got places that have a reference in this same context that go back to job and deuteronomy well i started digging down this deuteronomy rabbit trail and it's going to blow your mind because deuteronomy 33 Guys, do you remember this, what happened in Deuteronomy? What does the end of Deuteronomy represent, brothers and sisters? The end of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 34, is what? When Moses dies and, where is he? And Joshua, Yeshua, the son of Nun, takes over and brings them into the promised land. That is the end of seals to the beginning of trumpets, just before the beginning of trumpets, right? It's the representation of Jesus having come at the end of the sixth seal, and he is the one who is going to take them over into the promised land. The Moses type who dies is like the, is like the John the Baptist type, okay? Is like the John the Baptist, those that were killed is like the is like the um almost like like the leader as he was right so you've got this leader portion and he can't bring them over you have this john the baptist who was beheaded who is a type of the time of seals and you've got the elijah portion who are those who are alive taken up in a whirlwind who all represent this same category of people in this period of time so what would be chapter 33 right near the end of seals right at the time of the end of the sixth seal check it out <clears throat> and don't forget where did we find it we found it with its relation to acts chapter one in this turn it brought us to old testament which is deuteronomy 33 in verse 14 that we're going to get to listen how deuteronomy 33 starts in verse 2 
And he said, the Lord, Father, came from Mount Sinai and rose up from Sir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of his saints from his right hand, went a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand. Does this sound familiar to anybody? The Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion. He's got the ten thousands of his saints with him. His right hand goes a fiery flame, which is the law. And then he's got what? All the saints are now in his hand. These, these two verses are absolutely killer. Listen to this. Let's go look at it. Watch this. Let's go into 2nd Esdras first. Okay? 2nd Esdras is something we have taught on so many times. We've brought it up many times over the years because this chapter 13 is, is the picture of seals. You know, we don't go, we don't uh, um, delve too far beyond that sometimes, but we do every once in a while to talk about these additional three days, right? Seven days, whereas seven years, then you got three more days, it's three more years, right? It goes into the time of mid trumpets, and then you see it gets even worse. It's crazy, all right? But what do we know about this one? Well, starting in verse 29, right? The Most High will come to deliver those. Who's, who's the word that means deliver? Right? Who represents the word deliver? I'll show you who deliver represents. Hosea. Hosea. So right at the beginning. Hosea, who is Jesus, that means deliverer, which is Yeshua. We know that Hosea, Osi, has his name changed to Yeshua later at the end of seals when he's coming as salvation. But he starts as deliverer. Again, something we've taught on many times. Let me bring that back to Deuteronomy. Let's go back into 2nd Ezra. What do we know comes next? Bewilderment of mind shall come over all those who dwell on the earth. This is, this is a, a picture of the beginning of Luke 24 and the typology of the resurrection when bewilderment came over all of them, right? And then it says, and they shall plan to make war. So see, they're not going to break out in war against each other right away but they plan to make war against each other, right? City against city, kingdom against kingdom, people against people. What is that? That is the beginning of Mark's discourse, and it's the beginning of the red horse rider and the start of the 14 years, and it will begin with an attack on Jerusalem. That's the beginning of it, okay? And then it breaks out into World War III. Then it says all of these signs and all these things. So now it's saying all those things essentially that take place during seals and the signs and the things that I had told you about would occur before, then my son will be revealed okay it says every man shall leave his own land and the warfare they had against one another and an innumerable multitude shall be gathered together as you saw desiring to come and conquer him this is the ezekiel 39 war and what does it say but he shall stand on top of Mount Zion. When is this? When does it relate to this purse, this portion of him coming on Zion? You got to remember, see, Revelation chapter 6, at the end of the sixth seal, what do they see? The kings of the earth, great men, everybody, they all hide in, they're all hiding themselves in the holes and in the, and in the mountains of the earth. What are they screaming? Are they just afraid of everybody's war? No, they're seeing something coming. And they're saying in verse 16, and said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Hello. Are you starting to see where I'm leading? They're seeing something coming. It's not going to be a mystery when they see heavenly Mount Zion coming in the clouds. They're seeing something coming and they're in absolute panic. 
rich, old, young, free, bond, it doesn't matter. They're in an absolute panic. Why? Because the Lord at the end of the sixth year of seals in that time frame is coming down on heavenly Mount Zion. And what do we know about the end of Deuteronomy? It relates to the end of the sixth year of seals. Watch this, right? What did it just say? It says he's got 10,000s of his saints. We'll cover that in a little bit. And from his right hand went fiery law, right? He's gonna breathe fire from his mouth with his words, which is the law. Listen to this. And Zion will come to be made manifest. It's gonna be seen, right? It's that rock, that, that rock carved without hand that becomes a great mountain. He's coming with paradise, the place prepared. And what does it say? Just like it says only in Mark, the place prepared and built. In the story of, of, of uh, preparing for the Passover, you only see prepared in Mark's, uh, in Mark's uh, uh, story, in his gospel. So prepared and built, just like he said in, in John chapter 14, I go and prepare a place for you that when I return, I'll receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And what do we know about John 14? Bam! The exact same time at the end of the sixth year, during the seventh year of seals, here he is coming with the place prepared. As you saw, a mountain carved without hands. This is the same piece from Daniel, <clears throat> right? What is it, Daniel chapter 2? When the gold, right, when the statue is struck at the feet and it falls and it breaks in pieces and it becomes a great mountain, right? The stone that struck it becomes a great mountain. This is that. This is at the end of the sixth seal and for that seventh seal time frame, that seventh year. And he, my son, will reprove the assembled nations for their ungodliness. This was symbolized by the storm. Now listen to this. And will reproach them to their face with their evil thoughts and the torments with which they are to be tortured. Listen to this. Which were symbolized by the flames and will destroy them without effort by the law, which was symbolized by the fire. What is it? Him coming on heavenly Mount Zion. He's going to have 10,000s of saints with him. And his right hand went out like a fiery law for them. Then what is he going to do? He's collecting all the saints. What do we see? And as for you seeing him gather to himself another multitude. So this one he destroys that came. The Ezekiel 39. He's destroying them. And then what do you see? Him gathered to himself another multitude that was peaceable. Peace, uh, peaceable. These are the 10 tribes, right? The representation of the world. The end of seals, the great multitude rapture. This is precisely, this is why I love this chapter in these several verses. It is a overall big picture condensed down of seals from the escape to him coming at the rapture. It's awesome. And now we can prove it out with Deuteronomy. What do we know about this collection of all the saints? Check this out. What about his collection of all the saints? How about chapter 24? Right? Look at what we see. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. See, the fullness of the world. What does the world represent? The house of Israel, the Gentiles grafted in. It represents the rapture, the great multitude. It represents the fullness. This is the end of seals. What is this fullness? It's the same thing we were told in Luke 21 that this was going to carry on, which was Mark's, which is Mark's discourse. But listen to what it says. See, for these be the days. So now. Get out of Jerusalem, the end of the 40 days of the Son of Man. Everybody flee from Jerusalem. They're going to see it be compassed about. It's going to be attacked and destroyed. And he says in Luke 21, 22, For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. What's he saying? At that point, after the 50 days, they receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost. They go out as Acts 1 from Jerusalem. 
and boom, Jerusalem is attacked, they're destroyed, and then World War III breaks out, and that is the beginning with the attack on Jerusalem, the beginning of the Red Horse Rider, and the beginning of the 14 years of tribulation. And it's saying, but woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. When is it fulfilled? It is fulfilled at the end of the sixth year of seals, at the fullness of the world, when they're going to ascend the hill of the Lord, Mount Zion. What is Psalms 24? Isn't it amazing that you have when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion connected to that seventh year right at the end of the sixth, right? Which is the beginning of the seventh year as John 14, right? You'll also see it's connected to Acts. You're going to see later this connection to Hebrews. It's connected all throughout to this seventh year when the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion with the Father with the Ancient of Days. It's all connected to this time frame. See, and what about Psalms 24? Look at Psalms 24. When do they see the mountain of the Lord coming down? At the end of the sixth seal, they see heavenly Mount Zion coming down. So Psalms 24 is a type of picture at the end, on this line, at the end of the sixth year of seals. What do you see about Ezekiel 39? You just saw that group that's coming to destroy and wants to attack him and conquer him. And he's going to defeat them with the word of fire from his mouth, with the law of his words as a fiery flame. It's Ezekiel 39. When? It's like right on this line at the end of the six years, it's representation. Over and over and over, these things are connected to the same time. It's awesome. What's another connection? How about this one? You guys will remember this one. This one is a much deeper mystery. I'm not going to go into all of it. We've taught on it a number of times over the years. I've, I've tried to explain in the past that I don't even remember how I found it. I it, it, it was one of those ones that was just the whole, I mean, the Holy Spirit leads in all of this. But this one was one, I don't even remember how it happened. And what it was, was the end of Romans is the representation of the the start of seals okay the 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 40 days the escape time and the beginning of seals All right the the first fruits of the the worker group right that that priscilla and aquila who put their necks on the line for the gentiles and you see a group that's already gone romans 16. then you go to the uh first corinthians 16. so you go to the last chapter of romans the last chapter of 1 Corinthians, the last chapter of 2 Corinthians, and you see the beginning pre-trib, and you see the workers about to go out. You go to 1 Corinthians, you see he's going to collect the saints, and then you see another first fruits group of workers. And then at the end of it, it's saying that now Priscilla and Aquila and those who are with them are gone, and they're greeting these workers. It's amazing. The start of seals to the end of seals. The start of trumpets and those that finish seals are now greeting these guys about to work trumpets. And then you go to 2 Corinthians and you go to the last chapter, verse 13, chapter 13. And how does it start? This is the third time I'm coming. Hello. <laughs> it's so awesome, right? It's incredible. Well, in the one for 1 Corinthians, it represents in the typology in it, in the prophetic typology, it is the end of seals. It's going to be the time of collecting the saints and the 144,000 being sealed, which is the next first fruits, which is the representation of the 144,000. And what does it say? Now concerning the collection for the saints. Yes, this was a money collection for the saints for those back then, but in the prophetic, it is about collecting the saints, it is about gathering them in. And a group of workers from these people who they will have chosen it says right them will i send to bring your liberty unto jerusalem 
because the 144,000 are sealed first to help bring the great multitude in because those seals workers ones aren't enough. They need help to bring in this great multitude. A lot of them are going to be dead, right? A lot of the people will die during seals, putting their necks on the line, right? Or having died for Christ. But majority of them will have survived. That's the difference between those who have palms in their hands and those in white robes. It's those who have died with the white robes and those with palms in their hands are those who survived till the Lord came and the rapture happened. He says, and I will winter and I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. You got to remember, Pentecost isn't the Feast of Weeks. Pentecost is 50 days later. Do you know why? Because Pentecost is this other harvest, is the great multitude, is the remaining harvest of the great multitude. Hello. It's awesome. I see your little text there, Mark. But I'm busy. <laughs> so it's awesome. And when you come down and keep reading it, look at what you see. You have another first fruits, right? The house of Stephanus, which is the first fruits. When you were at the Romans, you in Romans at 16, you saw it was another group that was representative of the first fruits. And so the reason I'm showing 1 Corinthians 16 as the end of seals is what do you see? A collection of the saints. Right? Those who are going to come bring liberty to the saints. Okay? I won't go into Romans. Romans, well, let me just show you real quick. Romans 16, you see it right here. Priscilla and Aquila, the helpers who put their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles, you see, for the world. What does Aquila represent? The eagle. You see, Aquila is the eagle. What is the eagle? The eagle is the overcoming side of Dan. The serpent is the non-overcoming side. So the eagle is represented, I think, by what? The, the scorpion. And if you overcome, you're an eagle. And if you don't under overcome, you remain on your belly and you're like a serpent. You belong to the serpent. The eagle is the overcomer. And you're going to see as Christ was on the cross, as the serpent in bronze, Christ defeated the serpent. And when was that defeat that he was representing? During the time of Moses. And Moses, as Deuteronomy to the end of Moses' death, when they're in the wilderness, and it's Moses' time, a representation of seals, when they have fled into the wilderness, which is like the Antichrist, who Christ has already defeated. Who's going to be there now to stand against the Antichrist? The seals workers. The eagles. Who are what? Co-heirs with Christ, who is also a type of eagle, as one of his representations? Awesome. Awesome. But what else do we know <clears throat> in relation to him saying in um, Deuteronomy 33 that not all the saints are in his hands in that type and shadow where it was in Moses' hands? When we go to Revelation 13, what do we see happen? Revelation 13, right? Uh, the Antichrist, right? He, the beast, he gets power to continue 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme and verse seven, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So clearly the saints are there during seals and to overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindred and tongue and, uh, uh, and nations. And all that dwell upon the face of the earth shall worship, worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world so you see the saints aren't collected here yet <clears throat> because they're there during seals this is the church they're there during seals but who's helping them eagles are helping them christ was the representation of that eagle that that one beast around the throne that represented the eagle and at his crucifixion he defeated the Antichrist, okay? Just as the son is from the father, the Antichrist is from his father, the devil. Remember, cherubim, seraphim, the Antichrist wants to defeat Christ. Satan wants to defeat the father. The son is from the father. The Antichrist is from his father, the devil. See how it all works? 
It's just incredible. Let's keep going. There's going to be way more detail going into this. So this being able to see this, I mean, it doesn't get any more clear. It doesn't get any more clear. You're going to still see the 10,000s of saints. We're going to talk about that in another place where we know is directly related to the end of seals. Because when he comes, we know he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. And who's there? Who's standing before him? The 10,000 times 10,000. All right. And when he comes, what does he do? He destroys them. After the destroyed, what does he do? Collection of all the saints, none can take out of his hand. It's amazing. Now watch this. Okay. We were talking about um, how this led us from Acts chapter 1 and that, that word for turn. And out of all these places where, where the sun is talked about, the S-U-N. Okay. The sun as the bright shining sun, the sun is represented by its word sun 160 times in scripture. Yet that one place that we saw this relation to turn and we saw how it related to John, uh, James 117, it had two places in the Old Testament with this one that we're focusing in on in relation to um, Deuteronomy 66, in those 160 places in the Old and New Testament, it brings us to Deuteronomy 33 of all places. The word son is used everywhere. Yet this one is the one it's talking about. Look at that, 134 times this word for son right here. Yet this is the one they say that that's representative of. You're going to understand as I build this all back in in the next few minutes to Acts chapter 1 to understand when those two men in white, probably angels in white, were saying when they would see him coming again. That all of this thinking because of the church and their seven-year thinking has nothing to do with the very end at the end of trumpets, but it's when their portion of time is over at the end of seals. Now listen to this, Deuteronomy 33, verse 13. And Joseph said, oh, see, and Joseph, blessed of the Lord be his land for the precious things of heaven, for the dew and for the deep that, it, it's like crouches, that couch, uh, coucheth beneath. First of all, what do we know represents even with Joseph? Okay. When we, go, uh, when we go into Hebrews chapter 11, this was one of the typologies as well, right? We know that this is the pre-trib. Enoch, uh, sorry, with Enoch, Noah represents the 40 days of the Son of Man. And what does Abraham represent? Abraham represents the rapture at the end of seals. And what do we see? Um, and Abraham was called, da, 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 sojourn, looking for a place to dwell. and uh place to journey and dwell in Isaac and the promise in Jacob looking for the foundations okay <clears throat> sorry i was thinking it was uh Joseph here but this one was Abraham okay let's go back to Joseph after all that time i was like wait a second i thought that was Joseph all right now i got it so here's Joseph and the reason i was also trying to make a point with Joseph is because you're going to see in this conversation as it goes further in that we're still talking about this connection to Jesus who comes from Joseph. And Joseph is from the house of Israel. Joseph had Ephraim and Manasseh, for which Ephraim is where Christ came from. Yet he's called clearly from the tribe of Judah. So what you're going to see as it continues to build is how does this transition take over? Uh, it's not going to be crystal clear, <clears throat> but I believe we're going to see definitely some more clues to it. You see, just like it says here, symbolized by the flames and will destroy them without effort by the law. So there's this portion of time by the law, and we know this time when it comes to the end, everything is over for the world. It's going to revert back to the time for the Jews. 
the time of the world the time of the gentiles the house of israel it's over you see we've understood this also from daniel chapter 8 where it says the um time times and dividing of time this time time and dividing of time has nothing to do right here see all latter time latter time latter time where is it i thought it was in chapter eight is it actually in seven give me one second it's even better if it's in seven because that's where we're going to be going anyways i thought it was in an eight see i don't always have it at the tip of my tongue well mostly let's see come on it's got to be in here ah there it is it is in chapter seven all right so we're going to come back to this on another point in chapter seven but you see this is the end of seals <clears throat> when the antichrist is killed right we we're going to see this earlier in see in chapter seven it's the end of seals um we know antichrist is going to be killed and the rest of them have their dominions taken away same with the false prophet the false prophet isn't yet killed but the antichrist is and all of those people in that battle remember all of those that came to fight in in and come to conquer him okay when he came on mount zam but he destroys them by his by the flame by the by his word of the law and the word okay you got to remember this because when is this going to happen at the end of the sixth seal in right at that time at the beginning of the seventh that seventh year the end of the sixth of the start of the seventh year that is this symbolic time and you're going to see this all over the place and this is what we're talking about here <clears throat> what happens in daniel 7 25 it says and and he shall speak great words against the most high see the antichrist is always speaking great words okay against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the most high and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until see didn't we just see the saints being given over into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time you see this only used one time this is not the same it is not the same as i think we can bring it up with this it is not the same as three and a half years into trumpet so in the 11th year one two three and a half so in the 11th year when satan is cast down and they fly on the wings of an eagle hello when they fly on the wings of an eagle why because we know he's got to do it again and it just so happens that's the time of the eagle interesting right so they fly on the wings of an eagle and they're gone for a time and times and a half a time that in revelation 12 14 is the final three and a half years to the very end of the 14th year of tribulation the lord will return after two and a half years as daniel 12 uh, i think four says or seven that satan's time is going to last for time times and a half there's no end and the difference is that it's like one two and a half not one plus two plus a half okay that's revelation 12 14. daniel 12 is telling you that satan's time is going to last two and a half years and that's when the lord returns feet down on the mount of olives at the start the you can say the end of the 13th start of the 14th year and will destroy the enemies that'll be the greatest battle will renew the earth and when the 14th year is over they will return from having been hid in the wilderness for those final three and a half years so those time times and half a time and time and times and half a time are all talking about the three and a half years middle of trumpets time frame the one from daniel chapter 7 is not talking about this time it is talking about the end of seals this is all about the end of seals it is the dividing of time 
it is the end it is the fullness of the world as we were saying earlier it is the time for the collection of the saints it is the time when the peaceable group comes in which represent the world in those 10 tribes which is the gentiles grafted in as well it's it's the time when he comes with his flame and destroys them the enemies okay with the words of his mouth it's all related to the seventh year of seals this is why we see this up here about when the ancient of days does come as well when the ancient of days does come this is the father we'll talk about this in a bit but you see he has thousands of thousands ministered unto him and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him okay these are the same ones these are the ones that we're seeing here in this deuteronomy context as the end of the sixth year of seals listen to what it says now we go into uh, deuteronomy 33 verse 14 for the precious fruits see that for the precious fruits fruit and grain who who are the precious fruits the ones who produce fruit right who are the ones producing fruit one for grain and one for fruit you have the seals workers and you have the 144,000 well listen to this brought forth by the sun what brought forth by the sun and for the precious things see that not fruit things and for the precious things brought forth this time it has a definition to produce so you have this precious fruit who represent these groups of workers and they're what they helped also to bring about these precious things and they were what the produce that was what expelled it's only used even one time what is it what does it represent these things that were driven out that were divorced that were put away didn't he divorce israel those that were that were divorced that were separated that were put away and what happened it says that the sun brought these guys forth and that the precious things put forth by the moon so the sun and the moon helped bring these things forth you guys know who this is who do who do the sun and moon represent false prophet and antichrist right you guys remember that in isaiah 24 in isaiah 24 we see that at the end it says that the moon shall be confounded what does the word confounded mean shall be ashamed and the sun shall be ashamed which also means disappointed and confounded when the lord of hosts shall reign in mount zion and in jerusalem before his ancients gloriously why on earth are the sun and the moon ashamed and confounded because they fell they fell we all know that they're off course and there are they are typologies of who rome and muslims right the mahadi and rome with the church the sun and the moon are typologies that fell as we know in in the big picture in in that big picture in the creation of genesis 1 in the days we know it is the sun and the moon that end up falling off course. That's why the sun is off by two months. That's why the moon is off. Every, every month it falls behind a day. Approximately. You see? So who are the ones represented as the sun and the moon? False prophet and the Antichrist. What did the hell, false prophet and the Antichrist do? They helped the precious fruit and things which are the harvest be brought forth the lord god used them to bring forth 
the harvest. This is exactly what we were saying. Is as terrible as the as the tribulation even of seals is going to be. It is the Lord isn't doing it because he hates everybody. He's doing it because he loves everybody. He's doing everything he can to wake them up because it is their final chance. Faith through declaration in Christ will end at the end of seals. It will be over at the end of seals. You following? And when it goes to the time of Judah and the seven years of trumpets, the Lord is already there on Mount Zion. Remember, he becomes the Melchizedek, the high priest and king. Listen to what it says in 33, verse 16. And for the precious things of the earth and the fullness thereof. Hello. What was Psalms 24, the exact same time frame? The fullness thereof. Same time seeing him coming on heavenly Mount Zion for the fullness thereof of the world for the collection of the saints at the end of seals. It's awesome, awesome stuff. And imagine, it's, it's, we haven't talked on it too, too much, but we have done videos on it. And I've mentioned it in passing, this, this whole story of Moses, right? How Moses represents the time of seals that I was talking about near the beginning. And it's just like as Joshua, Yeshua, represents the time of trumpets. You see, it's the exact same. He takes them over into the promised land. What is the Lord doing at the collection of the saints? Moses dies. The John type dies, right? The great multitude rapture taken up in a whirlwind to paradise, just like the alive as, as the uh, uh, um, Elijah. This is what this story is all telling us about. And then look at what it says. Uh, is the fullness thereof, uh, continue in verse 33, 16. And for the goodwill of him that dwelt in the bush, let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the head of him that was separated from his brethren. His glory is like the firstling of a bullock. What? Now is he coming like a bullock? You see what's happening? He's coming as the son of man, right? He's at the son of man at the beginning of seals, like a man walking around for 40 days. The world's going to not believe who he is, right? Only those who are following him and will believe and will be the workers. And what else do we know? Well, that's one of the four beasts, right? The four representations of, of the 12 tribes, right? The heads of the tribes as they camp around the, the, the tabernacle, around the temple. And in heaven, those are the four, right? That are around the throne. One being the man. And when he comes as seals, he's what? At the end of seals, is he coming as the bull? And his horns are like the horns of a unicorn. With them that shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. And they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they the thousands of Manasseh. Well, isn't that pretty interesting? Because when we were in Daniel 7, what did we see in Daniel 7? We know it. this is all about seals, and the Antichrist getting his time to continue for 42 months, until what? Until the Ancient of Days did sit. This is the Father. And then what does it say? A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands of thousands, thousands, thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. I beheld the voice, uh, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame 
as the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away and their lives were prolonged for a season and time. We know the Antichrist is killed here. And during the first half of seals, he's not in the, I mean, of trumpets, he's not in the picture. And when Satan is cast down, he opens the pit. And of course, the Antichrist comes back. And so do all those other things come out of the pit. That's why mid trumpets is going to be even way worse than mid seals. What do we see happens here now at the end of seals? Daniel 7, verse 13, after Antichrist is killed. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds. Luke's group, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the end of Mark, right? Mark, um, in his discourse, coming in the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all, the, that all people and nations and languages should serve him. Hello. Hello. You seeing what's happening here? How does he make a covenant with all nations? If he's never going to be seen, if he's just going to be in the clouds. He's not going to remain in the clouds. We know he becomes one of the, he is one of the two witnesses. We know he is the, the Yeshua Joshua type. We know he becomes the high priest and king. Right? This is something that Jews have pondered for a long time. Because what do Christians say? They say, well, isn't Christ the Ancient of Days? And yet Christ is the Son of Man coming in the clouds? Because we know it's Christ who's coming in the clouds in Luke. How is he the Son of Man coming in the clouds and yet the Ancient of Days? It's amazing how this baffles people. But do you know why? because the church can't see the separation. It's the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Are they perfectly in unison as one? Yes, but they're not the same. We've taught on this many times. Here's another clear picture of it. Here's, here's a little video clip. Here's a video clip of it. I'm gonna share with you right now. Listen to this. It's just uh, like a little under two minutes. Ancient of days sat. His clothing was like white snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. And look, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and kingship. Why was it so shocking to hear Jesus claim that he was the one coming on the clouds? Because everywhere else in the Old Testament, that expression was used only of God himself. For instance, in Psalm 104, Yahweh, the God of Israel, makes the clouds his chariot. But Daniel 7 is an exception. God was already in the scene. He's the Ancient of Days, seated on his throne. That means the one coming on the clouds was a different person. The scene has God in human form twice. He is the seated Ancient of Days. And you would also expect God to be the one coming on the clouds because that is a title for him. Because of this scene, ancient Jewish theology had a doctrine called the two powers in heaven. They actually identified two Yahweh figures in this scene. Jesus claimed to be one of them, the Son of Man. Exactly, oh, and by the, the way, I saw a post in the forum uh, Michael Hazer um, has stage four cancer and he doesn't have much time left. So prayers for him and for his family. We're definitely going to be seeing that brother soon. I pray no pain from and it's it's quick. And uh, we pray for his family and um, all who are who are with him as well. So did you see did you hear what was being said there? You see. The, the church can never understand how is it that God is the Ancient of Days and God is there as the one coming to the Ancient of Days. Two powers in heaven. See, the Jews did understand. Because one is God the Father and the other is God the Son. 
it doesn't get any more clear oh my goodness where was it the other day uh ephesians gave it to us in chapter six if i remember correctly the other day we were in it in ephesians chapter six no i think we ended up going from six and then going to three you see that what we end up seeing is i thought it was here yeah here it is right here ephesians 3 verse 9 and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in god that's the father who created all things by christ jesus what's so hard for people to understand that means what that means in the beginning this is jesus jesus is the first the beginning this is the first fruits right this is the harvest the first fruits as the feast of first fruits in christ in the beginning in christ god created that is 100 percent what ephesians 3 is telling us is jesus god yes he's god over all the little g gods but there's still the father god who gave it to him to go and create so did christ create it all absolutely but whose is it it's all from the father that gave it to the son and said go and create it's all yours but there's still father god and this has stumped people incredibly it has brought division in church in churches but it's all over and one of the best ways if not the best way to understand it so that you have clarity is when you understand the differences in the gospels when you understand the different portions to the different people at the different times it all starts to open up to you it's not jesus coming to jesus in the clouds coming to himself sitting on the throne come on see what is this period of time this is when the son of man is being given dominion and glory and a kingdom what do we know happens at the seventh seal in the seventh year right there was silence in heaven for about the space of half an hour that's the period of time that the lord will make a covenant with all nations with all people and then when Satan's cast down, what happens? That covenant gets broken. That's why in Zechariah chapter 11, we've read many times and taught on it that, that, that the cedar that has come down and the vintage of old, which is Satan, is cast down. And then Zechariah goes on to talk about having to break his covenant, which he made in that, in, that he had made with all people. And he broke it in that day why because satan was cast down right the covenant is broken and that is why in daniel 9 you read about the final year daniel 9 verse 27 is about the final year of the 14th year of tribulation when he returns feet down he destroys the enemy for all they had done in destroying the temple and everything that they had done and the craziness that it's going to be this is him this is him and he confirms that covenant that he had made at the beginning of trumpets or the very just before trumpets started when you understand the 14 years all of this makes sense it's awesome so like we said when then we go into deuteronomy and we go back to deuteronomy chapter 33 we're done in 33 but just to make the the final point we see him on heavenly mount zion coming we see the the fiery uh uh law coming out of his mouth you're gonna see this represented later as well there's a beautiful piece of scripture and you're not going to believe it in all of these places where do you think it should be it's got to be in the seventh year of seals it has to be in the seventh year of seals well guess what 
It is. It is. <clears throat> okay, so we've seen this. And then what do we know happens? Of course, you come to chapter 34. Now Moses is dead. It's that representation of the end of seals. Yeshua, Joshua shows up. And what happens? Joshua, the son of Nun, you go into Joshua chapter one, and he leads them into the promised land. Remember this Joshua, son of Nun? We've taught on it many times. Joshua or Yeshua, he is a clear image, a typology. Joshua as Jesus coming at the end of seals here during the time of trumpets. We've shown how in Numbers chapter 13, when this revelation <clears throat> of Osi, the son of Nun, and Moses changes his name from Osi, the son of Nun, to Yeshua. See, to Joshua, Yeshua. And his name was Osi, which meant what? Hosea, the deliverer. So he's going from deliverer, as we saw at the beginning, at the escape of the pre-trib, we see deliverer, who is represented by Hosea, who has his name changed by Moses to Yeshua, or Joshua, which means Yeshua. And of course, we know that means what? From salvation, right? He will save. You see? All of these things, guys. He's coming. He's getting his victory over this group. But you know what else is really interesting? We've been talking a lot, uh, I guess over the last little while, actually about two and a half years or so, this son of Noon, how Noon in the, in the Hebrew alphabet is represented as the 14th letter. And it, it revealed to us Taurus and Christ is represented as Taurus. He is the beginning, right? Coffee. He is the beginning. Well, I had three people send me this same video, and I'm not going to show the video, but I'm just going to make a point from it. And it was that noon, as we've been talking about, and I shared in the previous video, that noon represents in, in for hundreds of years now. Now, it was changed. You see, I want to show you this because it's awesome. Noon, let this sharpen up there we go so noon see you got aleph which is the beginning the ox right this is taurus this is christ the beginning well the 14th letter of the hebrew alphabet is noon and it's now represented as seed air sun okay well of course that is christ okay there's a representation within taurus <laughs> and the father and the son and we were sharing in the last video how the 14 and noon okay the 14 and noon is the left eye if we're looking up at taurus which is called the bullseye and it represents the 14th letter it is the 14th brightest star in the sky and it means 50 and we've talked and broken down those things and it means air and it means sea because we're what we're co-heirs with Christ. And it just so happens that that eye was the revelation given to us as the connection to Taurus with Christ as heirs. It is wild. But guess what? Guess what? This is awesome. The old way, <coughs> the really ancient way of the description of noon wasn't as a seed <clears throat> excuse me hopefully this will clear up in a second it wasn't as a seed it was represented as a serpent here it is right here um noon or the end see the end this is the 14th letter it's noon and this is what was sent to me in relation in this video that this woman was talking about, you know, where it came from. This is what it originally was. This is what would happen. It got changed. And when people think these changes, like this noon as the 14th letter, which used to be represented as a serpent, 
and not what is now called a seed as an heir, people think, <coughs> excuse me, like in her study in this video, that really the, con the, the, the connotation is that it's negative. <laughs> Guess what? Remember we were talking about the serpent on the cross, right? The serpent that bit, what does the serpent represent? Tribe of Dan. It's the tribe of Dan. But the tribe of Dan has what? Two sides to it. One side, this is so awesome. One side of Dan, as many people have believed over the years, <coughs> the, this, this, the Antichrist is going to be from the tribe of Dan. That's what many people have talked about. Right. And and the Antichrist is like a, is like the son or, you know, the the partner son representation of the serpent. Right. It's the Antichrist that's coming for Christ's people and it's Satan coming for God's people. So when Christ died on the cross, who did he die for? He came but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Remember in the creation story, the days that group represented in that creation of males and females? That is the representation of the light group, the Mark group. And he came to save them. So when he died on the cross, what were we told in John chapter 3? In John chapter 3, we're told in verse, starting in verse 14, and Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but should have eternal life when did it happen when did it happen in the old testament it happened during moses's time when they were whining and complaining in the wilderness which is a type and shadow of the midst of seals it's a typology of the midst of seals. That's what we've been talking about the whole time. Moses' period is a type of seals. We've been showing and talking about how the end of it is like Moses' death and then Yeshua shows up as the Joshua leads them into the promised land <coughs> and trumpets comes. When he leads them into the promised land, where are they going? They're going to the mountain that he came on. They're going on to the mountain prepared. They're going to paradise. The first group goes to the third heaven. The second group goes to paradise. The third group is his return. Theirs is the city. So Moses representing the time of seals. And what happened? They were in the wilderness when they fled. What happens in Mark's discourse when they're going to flee into the wilderness? They're fleeing from who? Antichrist and false prophet. Who do the false prophet and antichrist represent? The sun and the moon. Right? Rome and, and uh, Muslims. Right? Or we'll say the Mahdi. You see? They're the ones chasing the saints away and attacking and destroying the saints during the time of seals. And in the wilderness, the serpent was biting them and they were dying. The Lord tells Moses to make one of bronze and put it on the cross. And then what does Christ do when he comes? He is the representation of that defeated serpent on the cross. He defeated the serpent on the cross. Who did he already defeat? He already defeated the Antichrist. He already defeated the sun and the moon that fell, Lucifer. You could say the son of Satan. He's already defeated him. He already died on the cross. He has already saved this Mark group, Light of Seals. He is only trying to wake them up during this time and the false prophet and antichrist thinking they're killing everybody. That's his to try to get rid of everybody. And in fact, the Lord is using them to bring about the fullness of his people. Not one will be lost. Not one will be lost.
they will all be in his hand, just as the end of Deuteronomy said. He's already defeated them. Who did he defeat? What was this serpent? What was this serpent that got put on the cross? Well, the serpent represents Dan, right? The serpent is the non-overcoming side of the tribe of Dan. The non-overcoming side of Dan. What's the eagle? The overcoming side of Dan. What was Christ representing in that moment on the cross? The eagle. He was a representation in that moment as the overcoming eagle. You know what's fascinating? Is we know in the alphabet, the ancient noon was a serpent. The more recent ancient, you could say, the more recent ancient, because it's been around still for hundreds of years, is the noon is represented by the seed or air. So in the Old Testament, it was a representation of the bad side of Dan as the serpent, and in the New Testament is, representa is represented by the eagle who is the sun and the air. But check this out. Who are the workers represented by during the time of seals? Remember I told you Romans 16? Who are the seals workers represented as? <clears throat> are we not told they're co-heirs with Christ? Are we not told they have a place reserved for them in heaven? Who are the representation in the New Testament of the seals workers as Dan and Ephraim? Well, we know who Dan is, don't we? Romans 16, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, whom have for my life laid down their own necks. You see? They're putting their necks on the line during seals. Unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Who is Aquila? The co-heirs with Christ. The overcoming eagles. <clears throat> and what are these overcoming eagles? Who are they up against during the time of seals? The Antichrist and the false prophet. The sun and the moon representation as the one who is the serpent in the Old Testament on that cross, on that stick that was put in bronze, <clears throat> that was to be defeated. Represented by who? Represented by Mark's group, the light group, that creation in days who were corrupted by the sun and the moon who fell out of their positions. And what does it represent? The time of mid-seals, when Antichrist gets his power to continue, when he will bring about the destruction of the saints and go after them and so forth, until the end of seals, when the Lord returns and rescues them. Who were the heirs and the co-heirs that represent the modern symbol of the sign of noon, of the overcomers? They are the eagles. Wow. Wow, I didn't even get this till late this afternoon. I was putting all these other pieces together and I'm like, what, wait, wait a second. If that was serpent and now it's air, that was the serpent on the cross, this is the sun on the cross. Who are the workers during the seal? So this is the was and the is, and we're revealing the understanding in the is to come. You see, Christ doesn't have to come and die again for them, he already died for them. He just needs the co-heirs to help bring them in, to wake them up and to rescue them during the time of seals. It's awesome. It's so awesome. Remember the four beasts around the throne? Right? The four living creatures? What do we have? The lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. How is it going to start? 
We have the Son of Man coming for 40 days. The end of seals would appear to be the time of the ox. When he's cut off, right? And when he's cut off, when Satan is then cast down, when Satan is cast down, what do they do? They're going to flee on the wings of an eagle. What happens during this time of the eagle? During this fleeing away on the wings of an eagle? This is when Messiah is cut off. So during this time of the eagle, which is just like the representation he was when he saved the first group, he is being represented during this period of time of two and a half years. It's the representation of the eagle. You see the 40 days is as the man, as the son of man. At the end of seals is his representation as the ox. At mid sea, at the mid trumpets to the end of trumpets is his representation as the eagle, and what is he going to do again? He's going to be sacrificed again, but this time, who is he doing it for? We've taught on this, right? We've got that video called again. We've got the videos on the two witnesses. We know that he is one of the two witnesses. He is the Joshua Yeshua, high priest and king. And what ends up happening? We know the fulfillment of after three days and after three nights is when he's going to be cut off. When is he going to be cut off? At the end of the two and a half years with Satan who make war against them. And when the two and a half years are done, at the end of the sixth trumpet is when the two witnesses are killed. For what? Three days, three nights and half. So on the fourth day, that's because the sign of Jonah in Matthew of three days and three nights, which means sometime on the fourth day has not been fulfilled. He was not three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That prophecy has not been fulfilled. It was prophetic. And that's why the differences in the Gospels is so important. And what's he doing? He is the eagle represented again. And who is he defeating this time in the typology? He's going to die as an eagle type again. And who is he defeating? Satan, the main serpent of all. In his death. It's unbelievable. But then what happens? Well, there's still the lion, right? There's still the lion. What happens at the end when the Lord returns, then feet down on the Mount of Olives? See the lion of the tribe of Judah? You see, he's represented in all four of them. That's his understanding in the end of days. And, and it's, it's incredible because there's, there's still this transition. There's this transition that we're trying to understand, right? How does he go from Ephraim to the lion, right? How does he go from Ephraim to the house of Judah? Well, what is he? He's high priest, right? High priest. High priest is through the Levitical line. So was he through the Levitical line as Joshua? Because if you remember, watch this, uh, where are we? Genesis chapter 49. In Genesis chapter 49, we've seen these before, right? With Judah. Um, you see he's the lion's whelp when he comes at the end. A sepulcher, you see he's coming. Uh, he's the vine, he's the, the fowl and the ass and the choice vine. You see, that's in Matthew. That hasn't been fulfilled yet. When there's a fowl and an ass. Okay? The colt's ass. There's two of them. Just like you find in Matthew. That relates to the very end. Look at this. The blood is closed in blood of grapes. Okay? This is to the end of trumpets. But before that time... He's also the lamb, right? He was the lamb. He's the shepherd, the stone. We know he comes through, through Joseph <clears throat> because he's represented as Ephraim. And it's all throughout scriptures. Look at Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31 even tells us 
verse 9. Okay, what do we know about Jeremiah 31, verse 8? This is the great multitude rapture in verse 8. And it says, they shall come with weeping and with supplications. I will lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way wherein they shall not stumble. Again, where do you think you find this? Turns out it's in it's in the great multitude coming back. Okay, now look at this. He took them across the river. Okay, same thing going on. And listen to what it says. I will cause them uh, in a straight way wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. All right? Christ came from Joseph, but Joseph is from the house of Israel. So what happens? What takes place? It's almost like an end of a dispensation, and something happens. How about Christ's victory? Do you think maybe it's his victory? In that Ezekiel 39 war, in, in what we were reading in 2nd Esdras, in what it was relating to in, in uh, Daniel 7, in, in what it relates to in Deuteronomy 33. When, it, when this age of the fullness is complete and he's there on Mount Zion, right? What does he become? We know he is just like Zechariah chapter 6, Zechariah chapter 6 is a typology, the end of the sixth seal. And what do we see? Verse 11, then take silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. What is he? He becomes king and high priest. Who is the branch? We know the branch is Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, we've been talking about here, who is the other witness, is the one who lays the foundation, a physical foundation during the time of seals. That's all that's going to get laid during the time of seals. But then what happens? The Lord says he laid the foundation and he is going to complete the temple. He is going to get that temple built. He's the overseer, the, the general that's going to oversee the whole thing. And that's going to happen during the first half of trumpets. This is somebody, this is that anointed one that the Jews are looking for. They're looking for their Messiah and the one who will rebuild the temple. And I believe they think it's the same person, but it's not. Joshua is the Yeshua king and high priest. And what ends up happening? It tells us that they're going to rule together. See, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. <clears throat> Joshua Yeshua is going to be the high priest and king. Who is the representation, the, the greater representation of the high priest and king in scripture? It is Melchizedek. Who is the greater than Aaron? Remember, one of the typologies that we know about is because when Moses and Aaron, they struck the rock twice. One was because of Moses, hence the first time he came and saved them through salvation on the cross against the Antichrist. And now he's going to save them during the Moses representation of seals from the Antichrist. And then because he's going to be struck again, who does he have to save? He has to save the priestly line. He has to save the line represented by Aaron who caused the second strike. But you know what's crazy about that? We know it as the time of Jacob's trouble, right? We know it as the time of the trumpets, which is to Matthew. And we've often thought in the past, now we've known this a little better in the last little while, but in the, in the few years ago, we thought that this was a relation to the Jews, specifically to the Jews, right? To, to the house of Judah and so forth. But we know, even what is it, Zechariah 8 or Zechariah 7, that the house of Judah, see? The house of Judah and the house of Israel, so will I save you. You shall be a blessing. Fear not, let your hands be strong. This is the first year of trumpets. 
You see, Judah is there. Judah is there. It's not like they didn't get to be a part of that portion at the rapture. They were that last portion because what are they looking for? They're looking for their Messiah in the one who will rebuild. And if Messiah comes and there he is and he makes a covenant with all nations, that means Messiah <coughs> who is given dominion. We see the Son of Man is given dominion at the end of seals by the Ancient of Days. We know at the end of the sixth seal, the whole world is going to see this coming and is going to be in an absolute freak out with everybody that's left alive. The, the Mark group, the, the rapture group is going to be watching and they're going to be freaking out and they know their time is at hand, but they don't know exactly when it's going to be yet. It won't be for a few months probably after they have seen this coming. It's awesome. So what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing that him doing this again, as we've taught on a number of times, is he's doing it because of the priestly Levitical line. We know that there is a fall that is going to happen in the midst of trumpets through a portion, whether a single or through a group, within the midst of trumpets. And so he must do it again for what appears to be the house of Judah. And do you know something I had never seen before? He is going to do it for the portion of the house of Judah. It's wild. I'm going to show you guys that in a minute. I'm going to keep you on the edge of your seats because there's somebody in the group of the house of Judah that I didn't know that it was divided like that. When you see it, it'll now make sense why he's doing it again in trumpets, which is Judah's portion. Yet, it's the priestly line as we've been teaching. Why would this happen during the priestly line? Isn't the priestly line throughout all the tribes? Or was there something that happened when they got scattered? <laughs> it's awesome. I don't want to go there quite yet. We're almost there. I want to finish this end of seals. Okay, because all of this started for us <clears throat> in relation to Acts chapter 1. This is where all of this came out from. And what we see in Acts chapter 1 was this other piece that I didn't share with you yet, which was taken up. So clearly this is after the 40 days of the Son of Man. So they're not looking for this white apparel and in a cloud anymore. They're looking for him to come in like manner, which brought us to Deuteronomy 33, which is the typology of the end of seals and everything we just covered. All of this was pointing to us to the end of seals and then revealed to us what he did on the cross, which represented that group in the wilderness as Moses, which is the Mark portion, which is the mid seals portion, who he doesn't have to die for again, because that was what he did on the cross to combat that serpent. Now, the group is gathered in. It's the end of seals. They're about to be gathered in, I should say. And it's the end of seals. We've been taught throughout all of church history when they've gone into tribulation that this was a representation of when he comes at the end of trumpets. I am going to show you right now. It is not about the end of trumpets, just like this word revealed to us that it wasn't about the end of trumpets, but that it was in fact the end of seals when they shall when he shall so come in like manner. And I'm going to prove it to you now. I'm told you it's going to be so obvious that when you see it, for those that have been around even for a little while and understand the differences in the Gospels, when you see this, it's going to be so obvious. Okay? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner, which was representation directly related to the end of seals 
coming on Mount Zion for the collection of the saints and all of those things that we covered, which is taken up in the midst of verse 11. Are you ready for this? Take up, receive up. It's used 13 times. Are you ready for this? You want the evidence of all evidence that this is talking to the end of seals? Check it out. See the word? G353. Same word. When he's taken up from you, you shall return in like manner. It didn't use the same taken up as you saw right here, 60, uh, 1869. This is the reference to when he will return in like manner. And guess what it is? The received up, G353. Boom. Hello. Hello. It is used one time in all of the Gospels. One time. And its reference is the direct reference of Mark 16, which is what? What have we been teaching Mark is the whole time? The end of Mark. Mark is to seals. The end of Mark is the end of seals. Right? Remember this? Here, give me one second. I designed the grip six belt because there was three things that I hated. remember this go into the pre mid post. What is a picture of post? You have the triumphal entry stories, the transfiguration stories and the resurrection stories. When you go into Mark's resurrection story, it is a typology of the Lord returning after the six years of seals. And when he comes to give them the great commission, we've taught on this so many times, right? How he doesn't sit to eat with them. They were already eating. He unbraids on them for their disbelief that the Lord had come because who told them? The seals workers. The seals workers were telling them, hey, the time is at hand. Here he is. Oh, uh, no, no, you're crazy. This is what the typology is. Remember, he gives them the ability Right? Go and preach into all the world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature because they're going to help bring in the great multitude rapture. That's why the 144,000 are sealed first. These are a typology of the sealing of the 144,000 at the end of six years of seals. Remember that? Why do you think it says they shall take up serpents? Because they're going to be working trumpets. And what happens again? The story of the serpents is going to play out again. Mark 16, 19. Now listen to this. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up. There it is. Into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following why is he working with them because for those that have been around for a bit you know that it represents revelation 14 the 144,000 on mount zion with the lamb he is the high priest and king yeshua joshua who is with the levitical line the priestly line of workers of the 144,000 they cannot be killed they are sealed with the Father's name, and they cannot be killed. They are given power and authority and cannot be killed. What do you think is going to happen? Somebody's going to get a little too carried away. Somebody is going to fall away, and that's why we have Hebrews chapter 6 that told us about a group of people. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gifts and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves 
the Son of God afresh, which means re-crucify, and it means again. This is that group. From this group at the end of seals, the 144,000, they, some or one, a group, a portion, is going to fall away. And this is what's going to cause Christ to have to do it again. We see now that, okay, it's the Levitical line, but I thought the Levitical line was amongst all of them. Turns out the Levitical line isn't amongst all of them. They're not again, they're not in all of them. Turns out the Levitical line, when all the, the t- tribes ended up getting scattered, the Levitical line went to Judah. Makes sense, doesn't it? Because in Israel right now, in the land, there's the Jews, and you've got the priestly line with the Levites. You've got the priestly line there, you've got Benjamin, and you've got uh, uh, Judah. There's no, there's no Dan and Ephraim and Manasseh. They tell you that. They're all scattered throughout the earth. They can never find them. They can't really understand how to decode that. But they know who the Jews are. And those Jews of those tribes that are there, the two tribes, the priestly line is there as well. So to sum up this portion in relation to the received up, it's talking about the end of seals. You see, this group of workers who are chosen from Luke, you see, the end of Luke in his resurrection story, this is the group from Acts chapter 1 that are going out from Jerusalem, preaching and the remission of sins and all of these things, receiving the Holy Ghost from Jerusalem and will go out from there. It's telling us in Acts chapter, what was it, 11, that when he returns again in like manner is the end of seals when he comes at the end of seals in the same typology of this received up when he comes to seal and to take the 144,000 as the Levitical line, priestly line that will work under him, who is the high priest and king. Remember, who told, who's the ones, who are the ones that tell these guys to be ready? The Lord's come, the Lord's coming. And they're like, nah, no, it's not true. This is why the Lord unbraids on them. Who told them? The surviving ones from Luke. The surviving workers that were were chosen at the end of Luke, that, that remnant bride. Who is this remnant bride? We know they are Smyrna. Smyrna are what? They are the martyrs, right? Well, guess what? Go back into Acts chapter one, and it even tells you that they're the martyrs. You see, the 144,000 aren't the martyrs. They can't die. See, it was taken up in like manner. Where is it about martyrs? What apparel? Oh, shoot. Where was it? Oh, I can't recall where it was now. It was in here. There's apparel, white cloud taken up. Ah, the witnesses. There you go. You see? Because... Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth, right? These are the seals workers. They are witnesses as John the Baptist was not that light, but he was a witness unto the light. That first creation group in verse 1 and 2 of Genesis 1, they were witness to the light that came about in verse 3 when Christ was then made light. They are what? They will be the martyrs. These are the martyrs, the seals workers. These are the Smyrna group. They won't all be killed, but they are represented as that martyr group. They are Smyrna. And they will see him again when he shall come in like manner, which is at the end of seals. Both of these have told us and revealed that this is about when he comes at the end of seals. When he comes at the end of seals, we saw that he was received up. And when he was received up, it said, and sat on the right hand of God. Right? 
We've shared this thing about seating on being seated on the right hand of God. And when he's seated at the right hand of God, uh, I won't go into every piece. We're getting we're getting late here, but we see it in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, where Jesus says, and they said unto him, he said unto them, How say they that Christ is David's son? And David himself saith in the book of Psalms, the Lord, that's the Father, said unto my Lord, that's Jesus, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore calleth him Lord, how then is he his son? Right? When is he seated on the right hand? <laughs> After he's got victory. After he's gotten victory. Which is what? The world, which is his group, which was Israel, the light group, the house of Israel. The Gentiles grafted in till the fullness has come in. That's what it's all about. When we go to Psalms and you get to Psalms 110, that's what the exact conversation is. This is directly related to the end of seals, the same time. And the Lord Father, so you see the separation between the Father and the Son again, two distinct beings. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord Father shall send the rod of thy strength uh, the rod of thy strength out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. You see, he's going to still be ruling in the midst of his enemies. Not everybody's going to be happy during trumpets with him now taking the reign, right? He defeated Antichrist. Antichrist is killed. The rest of them have their dominions taken away, but they're still alive. So he's still ruling in the midst of his enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power in the beauties of thy holiness from the womb of the morning that has the dew of thy youth the lord father hath sworn and will not repent thou art a priest forever after the order of melchizedek so when is this now this is the seventh year of seals time frame the lord son at thy right hand shall strike through the kings in the day of his wrath. See, end of six years, that timing of the start of the seventh seal, uh, of the seventh year. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. You see, they're all coming to fight against them, thinking they're going to conquer them. And he's going to go out against them with what? He will destroy them without, without effort by law, symbolized by the flame of fire. The exact same story we were reading in Deuteronomy 33. This is when he's going to do it. The end of the sixth seal, the end of the sixth year of seals to the beginning of the seventh, right in that time frame. All of it. So where do we get these stories, this connection to Melchizedek? Well, we just saw, what do we see in the sixth year as in the end of the sixth year of seals in relation to Zechariah? You saw the same thing. Joshua, who became crowned as king as Melchizedek and high priest. And it's Zerubbabel, who is the branch who's going to be rebuilt, uh, who's going to do the rebuilding. Well, watch this. Look at where all this connects to. Remember, the tribe of Caleb was the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Joshua, see, the son of Nun, is Ephraim. So it's still as if he's this, this connection here with Ephraim. Numbers 13, we covered that earlier. We've talked about this. This was a a great revelation when we came across this about two and a half years ago. But now watch this. We know that in the time of trumpets, about the midst of trumpets, the, the question used to be, how, how does Judah fall? What happens with that portion of Judah? Well, it's not so much that it's Judah directly, as in the, the two houses, uh, the two tribes within it, it's the one that belongs to the Father. You see, it's those who have tasted, as Hebrews 6 said, 
They have been blessed. They've been anointed. They stood before the Father. They've seen things. They've been given power over things. Yet, we know that trumpets is related to Judah, to the Jews, to the house of Judah. Well, this is what I hadn't understood before. The Levites, you see, when, when all the tribes were scattered, the Levites, the priestly line, relocated into the house of Judah after Jeroboam uh, disrespected the priestly tribe Levites. They became part of the house of Judah. Now it makes so much more sense. We knew this in the sense that we knew it was the priestly line of the Levites under Christ during trumpets who is the head as the Melchizedek Joshua type as king and high priest, the mediator to the father from Mount Zion. But I never understood because how was it that it was still supposed to be related to a time frame of Judah? The answer is the Levites relocated to the house of Judah after the scattering. Hello. Watch this. Here we have in this video, this is what I wanted to share for a while. You're going to see something in relation <clears throat> to the genealogies discussed in Luke compared to Matthew compared to the, the Jewish Bible and the genealogy. The one person you're going to see, well, there's a number, but the focus in one of them in particular, but all three, but a focus in one of them ends at Zerubbabel. You see, this is where the issue comes in. It says, and Jesus himself in Luke chapter 3, verse 23, Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph. As was supposed. Well, we know he wasn't the son of Joseph. Joseph was, quote unquote, his, adapt his adopted father. When you go to Matthew, it tells of his genealogy from Joseph being his father. But we know Joseph wasn't actually his father. But when you follow the lineage, there's this priestly line through Judah. And I believe what we're seeing is this transition to when he is now the high priest and king, as he was to be, will now be fulfilled at the end of the six years of seals and at the going into the time of trumpets. That the end of the age, the fullness of the world and the time of the Gentiles has now come to the end. The house of Israel is brought in. The saints are brought in. The priestly line, which is now in Judah, is now going to be under him as the high priest. And that's why he's standing on Mount Zion with the 144,000. And that is why you see them with the Father's name written on their foreheads. They're before the throne. All of these things, that means that there's no way these guys could fall. You see? Their names have already been written in heaven. And yet, not like the SEALs group, okay? Their place is reserved in heaven already. This group, their names are written in heaven. And their name, father's name is written on their forehead. And yet we know some of them or one of them is going to fall. And it all goes back to when Aaron caused the second strike. It was Moses and Aaron. We already dealt with the Moses portion. Aaron brings about the second one in Hebrews 6. Tells us why. And now we're going to show it. We're going to be able to show it. But listen to this in relation to the lineage of Christ or the, yeah, the, the, the genealogies that are spoken about. And it's really fascinating because we know the importance of the Zerubbabel type in the end of days. So it's going to be fascinating to see that the Zerubbabel type in the end of days is where the Jewish Bible ends the genealogy.
Listen to this. Time. But let's look at the genealogies in Matthew and Luke in more detail. On this chart, I have three columns. The left column is the genealogy given in the Gospel of Matthew, which traces a direct line from Abraham to Jesus. The middle column is the genealogy given in the Gospel of Luke, which traces a direct line all the way from Adam to Jesus. Finally, the right column is a genealogy based on the Hebrew Bible, known to Christians as the Old Testament. Obviously, this one doesn't include Jesus, but it does uh -huh. cover everything from Adam from to, Adam a, man named to a man named Zerubbabel. They end at Zerubbabel, and what do we know about Zerubbabel? He is the branch who is going to build the temple. And who are the Jews waiting for? They are waiting for the anointed one who's coming to rebuild the temple. He's not the Messiah. He is an anointed one. The Messiah will also be here as high priest and king, but the anointed one, Zerubbabel, is the typology of the was that in the is to come is going to be the one rebuilding, overseeing it as all of it is getting rebuilt. Just as we read in Zechariah chapter 8, let your hands be strong because they're going to start rebuilding the city and the streets and the temple. It represents the beginning of trumpets. Fascinating that Zerubbabel is the one where theirs ends. Because in the typology, the end of days, Zerubbabel, who is one that was born in Babylon. So let's start at the top. But is a Jew, will rebuild it. You guys know who have been around for a bit who I think that might likely be. From Adam to Abraham, we can only compare Luke and the Hebrew Bible. And what we find is that the genealogy is exactly the same, with one exception. Curiously, Luke includes an extra generation. A man named Canaan is placed between Arphaxad and Shelah. Once we get to Abraham, we can compare all three genealogies. And up until King David, all three are exactly the same. Except, once again, Luke adds an extra generation. In place of Ram, we get two names, Arni and Admin. But when we get to King David, this is where the accounts in Matthew and Luke start to diverge. Matthew continues with Solomon, and his list pretty much matches up with the royal line of Judah, as described in the Hebrew Bible. The only difference is that he leaves out four names, Ahaziah, Joash, Amaziah, and Jehoiakim. One possible reason for this is that these four kings were said to have been particularly evil. In contrast, Luke continues his list with an obscure son of David known as Nathan. He then goes on to list a bunch of names that do not match with any known genealogy in the Bible or anywhere else. But then curiously, something strange occurs. Two names on his list suddenly match up with two of the names found on both Matthew's list and a list from the Hebrew Bible, Shealtiel and Zerubbabel. Now, it's possible that this could be just a coincidence and that Luke's Shealtiel and Zerubbabel are totally different people. But because of their placement in time on the lists and the importance of these two individuals in Jewish history, it does seem that Luke is referring to the same two people. But from this point, Matthew and Luke diverge again. And now, neither list can be compared to the Hebrew Bible because the main story in the Hebrew Bible ends around the time of Zerubbabel. The obvious difference between the last set of names on Matthew's list and the last set of names on Luke's list is that Luke's includes about twice as many names. So the assumption is that Matthew must have left out some generations here and there. After all, we already know that he did this earlier. The adding and skipping of generations is probably related to the fact that both Matthew and Luke were aiming to come up with particular sets of numbers. In Matthew, the entire genealogy can be Hello. divided into three sets of 14. 14 being 2 times 7, and we know that 7 was and is a particularly important number for Jews. In Luke, the entire genealogy adds up to and exactly 77 names. <clears throat> Let me lower the volume. And isn't it interesting that, of course, we know all these 14 from Matthew, <clears throat> but it equals 77. What do we know about this genealogy in Luke and where it's placed? What is the revelation of the end of days? It's seven, seven, seven. That's the big picture, right? So seven and seven to the end of seals being done. These were the easy seven that we're in right now, where the Holy Spirit is preparing and waking up the bride. And then you've got the seven years of seals, and then you've got the seven years of trumpets. Well, guess where the seven years or the 77 generations of Luke's ends with? Well, Luke chapter three is what? Luke chapter three 
in luke in order chapter 3 is the representation of jesus returning at the end of seals it is the lord returning in the seventh year at the end of seals and it represents that final seventh year of seals we've discussed it we've showed it many times luke chapter one is the pre-trib luke chapter two is the 40 days luke chapter three is his return at the end of seals and luke chapter four is return at the end of trumpets and it just so happens that it represents 77 to the end of the second seven which is seven and seven and leaves one final set of seven which is matthew's final seven from trumpets i thought that was kind of cool you see the connections are everywhere 14 seven and seven 14 of the seven and seven there's one final seven to go guys it's everywhere oh look at that got seven comments there you see it's all over the place well now watch this as we went into zerubbabel you're going to see this wording we were talking about this is now them at the beginning of seal at the beginning of trumpets with the lord on heavenly mount zion now watch this as i start as i bring this to the end you're going to see very interesting wording check this out this word is the hebrew word uh, is the greek word 3346 it means to transfer to change to transfer oneself or to suffer oneself to be transferred okay to go or to pass over to fall away or desert right for one thing to another look at this change sides what the heck what do we have this change sides what's the purpose of this well look at this acts chapter 7 hebrews chapter 7 why does this matter to us well we have something again in this chapters to years remember that acts chapter 7 hebrews chapter 7 what is all this period of time related to when the lord comes in the seventh year of seals and he becomes as joshua as melchizedek the high priest and king it's like this transition has happened right this changing over has taken place it is the end of the gentile age it is the end of the age for the world and the lord is now here as psalms 110 he is now high priest melchizedek king and high priest and he is going to be over the 144,000, as the end of the seal said in mark when he will follow them right he's going to be there with them wheresoever they go and it's all related to this period of time as him and Malchi- as Melchizedek. And what did it say? This connection was to this carrying over, this change of time, this change of priesthood. Check this out. What is Hebrews chapter 7? You got it. Same chapter to year time frame as Hebrews 7. And who shows up on the scene? Melchizedek, king and high priest. It's awesome. It's so awesome. Because watch this. Let me go to king and high priest. Okay? I wanted to go into certain spots. I think this was it. Watch this. We've talked about this, right? This king and high priest. And you have this, you see, that it's not a, 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 let's start in verse 11. If therefore the perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. Remember what happens. Remember what happens when he comes at the end of the sixth seal, the time of the seventh year of seals, the end of the six years of seals, in that start of time frame of the seventh year. Remember the law and the flame of fire, and it's the end of one age, and it's a it's a changing of time, a changing of law, a changing of a dispensation watch this okay what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of melchizedek and not be called after the order of aaron you see this melchizedek is the greater than this old order of aaron was we know that they fell we know that it was the levitical priestly line that caused them to be blinded 
when the Lord came the last time. We did a study. We talked on that not too long ago. So now he's coming as Melchizedek, and we know that Aaron was the priestly, was the, was the high priest responsible for the second strike on the rock, which was a typology of the second strike coming on Christ. Now listen to this. Verse 12. Hebrews 7, starting in verse 12. For the priesthood being changed. See that? There it is. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also. See? A change also. There's right back to the same word. A change also of the law. What happened at the end of seals? He comes down, he breathes on them through the word. He destroys them with the word, with the flame of the law. And now what's happened? There's now a change in the law that must take place. Because it's the end of the age and it's the beginning of the time of the Jews again. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. Listen to this. For it is evident that our Lord sprang ariseth out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. You see? Because within Judah, there were no priestly line. It, they, were, they were gods chosen throughout them all. But what ended up happening? At the separation, at the splitting, they, they all went to be with Judah. And as high priests, as this changing of times, as this changing of law and the season and time and this dispensation, this period of the world ending, the fullness being complete, it's being changed. Almost like this is where this change in the seventh year of seals when he comes to begin the time of Judah again. And it is yet far more evident. For that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. See that? That after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. Who is that? Christ. Who is made not after the law of cardinal commandments, but after the power of endless life. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You see that? I wasn't here to say that we've got it all locked down and how this is going to change over. How does he go from, from a, a, a Joshua, Yeshua, Ephraim side, which is why? He came the first time to save the house of Israel. And how yet this time he must save another group within Judah, which is also through this priestly line when Joshua Yeshua is made high priest and king as Melchizedek. When? At the changing time of the necessity of the change of the law. Because it's going to now revert back to the time for the Jews. Mark's time is over. The world, the church is over. And the time of trumpets and the final seven years will begin. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I don't know if you were able to take all of that in. I'm sure many of you were. You've been following for a long time. <clears throat> but this is awesome stuff. This is so awesome to be able to see that connection. That what Acts 1 is telling them is that it is them that are the workers. The, the eagle 
and the Ephraim, the Dan and the Ephraim workers on the good side that are going to be coming against the one who is already defeated, who they're going to come against and they're going to be victorious as the Lord is using the sun and the moon, the Antichrist and the false prophet to bring about his great harvest in the end. And he is using those workers from Luke, that remnant bride, to gather in, to wake up this harvest while the sun and the moon make it so hard on them that they have no other choice but to wake up and believe in their final stretch because they will not have the rest of their lives to do it. That is the portion and that is the wording that is given to us in Luke. And to see that connection, to see that connection of something we have known for years with Priscilla and Aquila as the overcoming Eagle Dan worker, as the co-heir with Christ, as the Eagle representation of the overcomer, of the Smyrna group working through seals because they have already overcome that destroyed serpent on the stick. That's awesome. That is awesome. That blew me away when I had realized this. The Old and the New. The Old Testament version, the New Testament version. They are co-heirs, seeds, co-heirs with Christ. And what are they? Noon, 1450, who in the ancient days, or in the times after Christ, I should say, they were called 14thers. They were mountain climber references as Luke through Haran. They are 14ers now. Brothers and sisters, I pray this blesses you. I pray it strengthens you. I pray it continues to keep you watching and to seek and search and to dig into his word. Study this out. See it for yourselves. I know you guys will continue to find more and more. That is always the way it happens. So keep digging. Keep seeking. Keep searching. Keep being diligent. Join us in the forum. Share it in there. And if you can, also Please continue to pray for us and for the ministry and for each other. And if you can, please help support the ministry as we continue to watch and pray and diligently seek the Lord until that glorious day that is moments, truly moments away. I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.